one of the things that I want to talk about today is balance. And what I mean by that is that when I was in training in med school at Charity Hospital in New Orleans back in the 70s, we had these wonderful experiences when things went wrong, those involved in those cases got to stand at the bottom of a pit and have all their senior faculty looking down on them wanting to know why. But we already knew the answer. The answer was we were not motivated enough, we were bright, not bright enough, we'd not worked hard enough. It was all about this culture of shame and blame. And we understand that at the end of the day that isn't something we should be proud of. And then people like Jim Reasons came along and he suggested that we take wonderful human beings and we put them in dysfunctional systems and stuff happens. And I'm going to suggest that that has moved us forward. The challenge is that I think we have gone too far in this notion of fixing dysfunctional systems because what we want collectively as medical leaders is the right combination between intentionally designed systems but the right balance, human accountability. Let me tell you what I mean. Now before we do this, goals and objectives, I want us to understand a range of behaviors that undermine a culture of safety. I'm not talking about spitting, cussing, and throwing. We understand that. Those things are unprofessional. But the problems that I deal with on a daily basis are much more than the person who throws, spits, and cusses. Number two, we got to have a plan. You can't deal with human accountability and professional accountability without an organized plan. You can't do it on individuals' personal courage. That is not sufficient nor sustainable. And then finally, I want to describe a method that can be used to identify high-risk physicians because, again, there are only a small number of our colleagues that create such distress. And this is not the 80-20 rule. Let me just tell you that 95% of the people who walk into our health systems are professional. They know why they're there. They do what they need to do. A few of us on occasion need a little prompting. Now, what you want here at Mattel, what we want at the Children's Hospital in Nashville is reliability. And I don't care about the science and quality jargon. What this simply means to me is that I want the right thing every time for every patient. That's what you want, it's what I want, it's what you want when a family member is here in this hospital, whether they're being treated by the geriatricians or anybody in between. To do that, though, requires intentionality. And what I mean by that is that there must be the vision that we can actually do the things that we think we can do. When I was in training at Charity in New Orleans, you were just going to get line infections. That just happened. It was the bad luck of the draw. These things just happened. I'm sorry. Move on. And we know now that we can absolutely eliminate so many of the things that were commonplace when I was in training, and I hope those of you who are joining medicine now will not accept the status quo, because whatever we do, we must do better, but that requires a vision that we can actually do that. The second thing that we need is leadership. One of the things I like to ask is, have you ever seen a chief of staff, chief medical officer, CNO, CMO, anybody within a health system that was opposed to hand washing? I've never seen that. And yet hand hygiene rates nationally are an abomination. And part of that is because we don't understand the concept of leadership. And I'm not talking about C-suite leadership. I'm talking about leadership at the bedside. So that if you see me fail to take full advantage to protect the patient that I'm treating, that you're going to be kind enough to give me a second chance. That's leadership. And finally, that does not occur without the realization of safety culture. And a safety culture is a place where individuals are willing to report and address what we call at Vanderbilt disturbances in the force. And we use that language intentionally. This is not shame and blame. It's just the fact that humans have slips and lapses. And when disturbances in the force occur, we are professional enough to provide feedback to our colleagues in a way that doesn't embarrass and doesn't humiliate. And that does not occur unless we have psychological trust. We don't fear that somebody doesn't have our back. And individuals who are part of our team trust that we're actually going to take these stories and do something in a measured and professional way. Who is this man? 
Who is this? This is Semmelweis. Semmelweis told us how many years ago that there was something that we ought to do every time. Now, he wasn't the most pleasant human being, and he was on a mission from God, and he irritated a lot of people, and at the end of the day, he had a bad outcome, right idea, wrong implementation. So what we want to talk about is right plan, right implementation. Let me tell you a story. Now, I'm going to go to an adult case. This is my wife. 57-year-old, bilateral arthritis of the knee, bone on bone, and it was time for two new knees. I remember driving into the hospital, taking her in. I'm sitting there in my office, and the orthopedic surgeon's giving me a call every 30 minutes to tell me how things are going, and I can remember the circular saw going on in the background. Wasn't exactly the memory I wanted. But she got through the surgery fine. She got taken to a room in a hospital where I work, and at the time was in charge of risk. And this case is superimposed upon our hand hygiene performance at the time my wife was in the hospital. That's not real good, is it? So I positioned myself in the hospital room so you could not get in to see her unless I saw whether or not you foamed in and foamed out. That's sort of a reasonable thing, right? Do I want my wife to get these two foreign bodies infected? No. Does she want them infected? No. Does their orthopedic surgeon want this published on the World Wide Web that he's had an infection in a case? No. So we're all aligned, right? So of the 92 individuals that walked in my wife's room, now I tried to dress down incognito shorts and a t-shirt so I could sort of hide a little bit. Of those 92 individuals who came in to check on my wife before she left the facility, how many of them do you think washed their hands? Anybody want to guess? 10 or, 12. 10 or 12? No, all 92. Because I sent 62 back to do it again. <laughs> I'm motivated, right? Should we all be motivated? Yes. Should we ask patients and families to do things we won't do ourselves? Should we ask patients and families to help us police our hand washing when we won't do it ourselves? I don't think so. This was a problem. So it was really interesting. Tom Talbot, our hospital epidemiologist, came to me right after my wife had been in the hospital. She did, he didn't know she'd been in the hospital. And he came to me and said, Jerry, we're having trouble with getting people to wash their hands. I said, no joke. So we did the standard thing. We put the task force together. We created a marketing campaign. We went out there and we put in dispensers and we did all the sorts of things that we routinely do because we had a problem, got it done. And each one of these things is an essential element to get people to do whatever is the right thing. And then we started measuring. And we measure our hand hygiene, and I'm not gonna talk about the science of hand washing measurement because I don't think many of those systems are really good anyway. In fact, I joked with leadership that we were gonna hire 18,000 new employees because it was Vanderbilt. And if we were gonna manage and measure hand washing, we wanted the best measurement possible, so I was going to assign an employee with each existing employee to track them around making notes all day. And since we couldn't afford that, we said we're going to have to choose a lesser method, but we will not argue the results. And I made all the leadership within the institution sign a pledge, and I guarantee it was very helpful. Then we started measuring. These are the units in our adult hospital, and what you see is that some of them in green are doing really well. And this represents a cumulative hand washing opportunities of the entire family. Some, you know, are getting there. And this unit down here, marked by the arrow, is we say in Tennessee, they could do more better. <laughs> so the question is, how do you deal with that? And we actually have a plan, and we use this plan to provide feedback to our professionals. And when there are single events, in a non-judgmental, respectful way, we want to have a cup of coffee and just give them an opportunity to do better. This unit, however, that I illustrated, shows a unit that appears to have a pattern. And when we see a pattern, we send the paired physician and nurse leader of that unit a letter in the mail. Dear colleagues, we know you're committed to doing everything that you can do to reduce the risk of acquired infections, both for patients and other team members. 
And this is very important. We've made this an institutional goal and everybody else is doing so well, but for some reason, your unit is not achieving what we expect. Now, we're gonna count on you, but we're gonna come by and show you your data. We trust you as a professional. I know you're gonna take advantage of all the resources we've given, and we're sure that next month's numbers will look much better. So I'd send a team member out to sit down and you can imagine the kinds of excuses, well, we don't have any dispensers. Well, you're in charge, get some. Well, they're in the wrong location. Well, then move them. Uh, this you know, area has dispensers outside, closed doors, but none inside. We'll put them in there. I mean, so at the end of the day, fine, I'm glad you're thinking about why you're not doing it. Your job as a leader is to go fix it. And then the things I love is somebody else. Oh, it's dietary, it's hand, fine. Let them know what you expect in your home. And so one of the things we were pleased with is like most institutions, you start down here in the 50s and we moved up to the 80s, which is exactly what you do with the marketing campaign, but you will not move it higher without a period of intensified monitoring and professional feedback as an act of professionalism. And what's fascinating, and we published this two years ago, surprise, surprise, as our monthly hand hygiene adherence rate goes up, what happens to our line associated infections? They go down, duh. It's not single factor attribution, but it is focus on detail. That's reliability. And it starts in every one of these line issues with washing your dang hands. And our chief financial officer likes this a lot because we have created very conservative estimates for the cost reduction associated with washing our hands so the cost of this initiative is hugely, is seen as a wonderful institutional win. So that was easy, right? And everyone responded in a professional way, right? Well, the problem is not exactly. Now, do you have audience keypads with you? Do you have an ability to vote? Do we get those distributed? Good. So in my role at Vandy, we have an electronic event reporting system, and when some member of the team senses a disturbance in the force related to what is asserted to be an unprofessional act, and by the way, failing to wash your hands is an unprofessional act. We define a an unprofessional act as any behavior or performance that adversely affects the ability of the team to do its intended outcome. Do I want my wife infected? No. Does your failure to wash your hands put my wife at risk and threaten an outcome? Yes, it does. So therefore, can I expect you as a professional to wash your hands? Yes, I can. And how often? Mostly? No. Every time. So I get this report. And this is a pediatrician. Dr. Hickson, a very senior and well-respected, mostly attending, was about to enter a patient's room did not pose, uh, pause to foam in. The nurse called Dr. Hickson's name, but before I could say anything, Dr. Hickson replied, don't start with that nonsense. The hand hygiene police are everywhere. I just want to give this family some good news. And proceeds into the room. Threat to safety? I mean, really? Now, it's interesting if you look at several studies, the question is that Dr. Hickson may not intend to touch a thing when he walks in that room. The reality is there's a contact with surface at least 90% of the time. If this event were to occur at Mattel Children's Hospital, just as described, I'm just going in to give some news. Don't bother me with this hand hygiene business, and I don't foam in. What percentage of the time do you think a nursing professional here would report this event as a disturbance in the force? Don't take forever to vote. <laughs> and for those of you from Chicago, I've got extra keypads. You can vote early and often. <laughs> we learned that in South Georgia way before they learned it. Oop, I thought I'd push that. 
Any last votes? Going once. What do you think about these results? Says to me, and this is a common state we find ourselves in medicine. You and I see disturbances in the force routinely, don't we? Yet, do I really want to go to an electronic event reporting system and put something this insignificant into that report? There's a balance in there. I mean, I don't want to be sitting around squealing on people all the time, do I? But on the other hand, what about that patient in the room? This is one of the challenges that we face as professionals. Where is that right balance? And I'm not here to suggest that this talk is about making humans perfect because we're not. I love to play golf. And I'm a pretty good golfer. And every once in a while, I'll miss a four-foot putt. I don't intend to, but for reasons beyond my comprehension. My putter comes out of my hand. It goes flying off in some direction. I do not understand why that occurs. The question is, when those events occur, will my golfing buddies on Saturday go talk about me in the grill once the round's over? Or will anybody engage me in a socially appropriate way? This is part of the problem we have in medicine. We love to talk about each other. We love to talk about each other. But what we are loath to do is to talk directly to each other in the most simple, kind way when they're missed opportunities. And as a pediatrician, my background, and the question I will ask you is that if you've got a three-year-old that's running toward the street, how long will you let them go before you attempt to engage and distract? And at what point will you intervene? Or do we take this for chance? Next question. In this environment, I just want a sense of where you think this organization is. If this event were to occur and there was an electronic report, what do you think the probability is that someone would have a conversation to share that observation with Dr. Hickson? I love this. I could not pre-program these answers any better than this. I thought you guys worked in the same place. What explains this variation? I mean, you guys don't even appear to work in the same place. It's amazing to me, and there are several hypotheses about why. Number one is that some of you may be right. Some of you may be deceiving yourself. Some of you may know the truth. Some of you may not. But the biggest issue here is for Mattel Children's Hospital, for UCLA and this distinguished hospital, are you a single system? And the answer is no. You're a thousand microsystems from neonatology to inpatient units down. I mean, and this is a part of the challenge so that within the Vanderbilt environment, I've got 192 microsystems out there, and they all perform at different levels. Just showed you that. So one of the reasons I say this is that the challenge we have is we have to take care of our own family, but we have to mutually support other families as well. Anybody want to have a conversation with this doc? It was amazing in this real case. This was a six-month experienced nursing professional who saw this immuno-incompetent patient and sought to speak to this highly influential physician. Let's say you go out of here today and you bump into exactly this situation. You just can't help yourself. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Would you have a conversation with Dr. Hickson? Yeah, I'd almost always have a conversation if I sell a missed opportunity. You know, occasionally, especially if I've seen him miss this opportunity before, you know, I'll keep a little running list in my brain and then I'll know when it's time to share. You know, occasionally, but I sure better check out how influential he is. Number four, you know, occasionally, but 
you know, I bet Hicks had really washed before he left the last room, and I'm, I'm sure he's so attend, uh, attuned to this that, that there wouldn't be a problem. You know, it really is his re responsibility. You know, wh who am I to say anything? Because sometimes I forget myself. And are you kidding? <laughs> you go out of here this morning, you observe a missed opportunity, wherever it is, whatever it is, are you going to speak up or not? Vote. For those 14, thank you. Continue the good work. Number two, you know, I don't mind giving a person a second cup of coffee or two because we all have slips and lapses, but don't give them three, four, five passes before you speak up. Number three, yeah, that's sort of real, isn't it? Especially farther down the totem pole you are in this hierarchy. There was a very famous neonatologist at Vanderbilt who will remain nameless. I still have a bruise on my chest because every time in rounds, she just pounded away at my stupidity. Was I gonna say something about Dr. Blank? You know, I really do feel embarrassed and humiliated with you hammering on my chest. I still got a bruise here. I guarantee you I wasn't going to speak up. I'm not naive. You know, I bet they washed before, and I appreciate the vo votes at seven. Are you kidding? Because this is a reflection of the kind of work we have to do to create right culture. But all of this is what it means to be a professional. You guys signed up to be professionals. But I don't think we've done a good job describing what it really means to be a professional. How many times have you heard that statement, gosh, he is such a great surgeon. And then what's the next word? Everybody knows that the next word is but. <laughs> One of the things that we can do to help elevate the profession is quit calling people great physicians if it's going to be followed by the word but, because in an age of safety science, I expect you to have technical and cognitive competence. I do. I am a very strong diagnostician. I want those skills to be respected. But if I do not model a commitment to clear and effective communication, being available when I'm supposed to answer pages, modeling respect for other team members who are critical to ensuring that outcomes occur, and because we are pediatricians in here, we can be a little touchy-feely. I also expect us to model self-awareness. Do you ever pause and reflect about how the way you perform and behave either enhance other people's ability to work or get in other people's way of their work? That's a part of a professional's duty. And professionalism promotes teamwork, but this is the problem. We like to talk about each other. We sure don't like to get into this issue of dealing with self and group regulation. But the question I'll ask all of you, if we as professionals won't do the regulation part, who's gonna do it? That's a part of what we're seeing now with all the publicly reported data. We haven't cleaned up our own act, so the public's gonna have to help us. And this is the balance we want. I want the engineers at Vanderbilt to help me and praise all of them and let's create lean. I want the most efficient systems. I mean, that's what I want. But intentionally designed systems are gonna be, be filled with humans and humans still have to wash their dang hands. Now, behaviors that undermine a culture of safety, I've spent 25 years studying them. I do not know why. I think because as a pediatrician, I was always into behavior 101. We often see these behaviors in terms of the throwing, spitting, and cussing. We hold a conference, we're about to hold a conference the next two days here in LA, and we spend some time helping individuals think about what are these behaviors that get in the way of quality and safety. And we've often thought of them in this illustration at Vanderbilt when we started this course, people would come in, they'd cross their arms, they'd have the most defensive body language, and I'd tell them, well, we gotta do a little artwork, and they'd look at me and say, I'm not doing any art. Well, I had a really good bartender, and he would not let anybody have a drink at the bar until you did some artwork. And it's amazing how people began to do artwork. Here's what we often see. 
And what we have learned over the years is that arrows are spit, and you see that this nursing professional is absorbing about half the spit, but there's more left over. In addition, one of the things we had a uh, psychiatrist who will remain nameless from this distinguished institution that attended one of those courses, and he was into art interpretation, and he saw stuff in this artwork I never saw. What do you see? Look at the nurse. What are the body parts that are missing? There are no hands and feet. Look at the contrast. It's amazing that individuals do not understand that these things are being portrayed in the stick figures that they're doing. But it symbolizes the fact that within this environment and within Vanderbilt and every place else, there are individuals that can neither flee nor fight back. They are stuck in positions. They see stuff and feel unempowered. But the thing that I was struck with was the year. Not only does this behavior impact performance in the moment. Remember what we said about reliability, what is one of the key elements? Trust. What do events like this do with the cumulative ability to establish trust with other members of the team over time? What does it do about future performance? I'm going to show you a paper we've just published. But this is the most common problem that I deal with at Vanderbilt. In the South, we're all just so pleasant and we sit there and nobody says a word. I just have no intent of doing what you've asked me to do. But I'll smile at you. The passive and the passive behavior is what kills us. The failure to wash hands, the failure to completely gown and prepare to put in central lines, the use and right stewardship of antibiotics, those things that will make a huge difference over the future, we just sort of smile or don't smile. So in our environment, one of the things that we've done is expanded our professionalism policy, not from being warm and fuzzy. I could care less about whether you're warm and fuzzy. It's about being respectful and allowing other professionals to do their work and not distract them. So we describe unprofessional behavior as any behavior or performance, because that patient that gets infected could care less about whether you define failure to wash your hands as a behavior or a performance issue, at the end of the day, they're sick. Any behavior or performance that adversely affects the ability of the team to achieve its intended outcome, and it's all about safety. And we framed it that way because rarely when we have to go in the courtroom, the issue is this professional was not safe. Now, why do we like to deal with this stuff? Because we don't. Anybody in here want to volunteer? No. In fact, there are two kinds of individuals that I don't want helping at Vanderbilt. I don't want the rationalizer and the apologist. I have never seen so many excuses for why Hickson behaves this way, and it really is okay this time. When something happens, you find them hiding under the table. The second group how many in here have seen that wonderful American movie classic, The Blues Brothers? I also don't want individuals working on these projects that are on a what? Mission from God. Because we find certain individuals that they want to get into this work. Oh, sign me up. I don't want either extreme. I just want good, reasonable individuals that will understand what it means to be a professional, but to do that, we've got to understand the barriers that get in our way. This is self-explanatory, isn't it? I'm dealing with a high RVU producer at Vanderbilt right now, and he is on the wrong pathway. But others are also concerned about that pathway. And it is amazing that all individuals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. Now, maybe it is that as a general pediatrician, we were a dime a dozen. Others are not a dime a dozen, and that is an issue that all leadership struggles with. But what we've learned at Vanderbilt is no one is worth it. And we have to get to that particular point. I want this individual to stay with us. But they've got to be the professional we expect them to be. Anybody want to interpret this artwork? I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> Let me say a real inflammatory statement here. I may come in and sit on this throne, but the question is, who leaves me here? And how many times within our environment do we create workarounds 
because I'm not doing this. That, by definition, is not high reliability, is it? That, by definition, is a threat to safety. And what's amazing, this artwork was actually done by a physician, chief safety officer at an institution we were working with, and his complaint was every time they rolled out a new safety practice, the nursing professionals went behind this particular doctor doing it for him. I don't want to do things to people. I don't want to do things for people. I want them to do what we collectively agree are safe practices. Consequences, there are all kinds of consequences. Part of the problem with medicine today and the waste that we have in medicine is in large measure because we cannot manage right human behavior. I've studied the malpractice system in, these, in the U.S. as was mentioned in the introduction. That's the tip of the iceberg. When we look at infectious disease cost in the U.S., when we look at surgical complications, practice dropout, talking bad about us in the neighborhood, all of these things are related to our inability to address the small number of team members that create unnecessary inflammation. Five most common hospital acquired infections, that's 9.8 billion annually, but that doesn't talk about the human tragedy for those individual patients. It's one thing to look at $10 billion. It's another thing to be the recipient of one of those infections. And we know these are preventable with right practices. The challenge is why in the world don't we insist, monitor, and provide feedback on those right practices every time? Interesting paper I'd encourage you to read by Phelps. I don't like his title. It's the how, when, and why bad apples spoil the barrel. And the problem is, by calling it bad apples, that implies there is no opportunity of restoration, and that's not true. I'm going to show you some results of the impact of intervention. But all of us know that some workspace is more comfortable than others. I want you to think about being an ICU nurse for a moment. And you in the NICU are doing a complex task and you need to focus on that complex task, right? Whether it's anything we're doing for line maintenance or I don't care what it is. And I have a reputation for being disrespectful and I walk into that unit. What are you as that nurse gonna do? You gotta monitor me. You've got to take some of your focus and you've got to focus on me from the moment I enter until the moment that the all clear is sounded. That's the reality. So we just did a study with our PARS data. Now the PARS program is a program that's based upon the fact that unsolicited patient complaints are great proxy measures for malpractice risk. And we know that physicians that generate lots of unsolicited patient complaints have increased numbers of lawsuits. And the hypothesis to this point, it's related to the fact that they don't play well with others. So when there are unexpected outcomes, families are unhappy, and that's true. But my question has always been, is there more? Because if I behave in a disrespectful way to patients and families, whether it's passive aggressive or aggressive, do I take those same characteristics into the NICU? Do I take those characteristics into the surgical theater? And what does that do to team performance? Here are some complaints about Dr. Hickson. Dr. Hickson did a very poor job of communicating. He raced to an explanation of what we should expect. Then he left without giving us a chance to get clarification. Dr. Hickson didn't listen to me. Dr. Hickson interrupted me while I was explaining my child's symptoms and said, I got it. I already know all I need to know. Now, I don't know whether those statements are true or not. I don't know. I just know that there are disturbances in the force, and we know from our JAMA paper that of those distribution, and I can promise you here at UCLA, 50% of your physicians here don't get any unsolicited complaint in a four-year audit period. Occasionally, a patient gets a complaint, but 5% of our team members at Vanderbilt, and now we've done this at over 100 sites nationally, 5% of physicians get 35% of these stories. So if individuals model disrespect, do they take it in the surgical theater? And one of the things that we did is that we took 66 surgeons where we had PARS data, we took 10,000 surgical procedures, and we stratified the pre-op risk into two big buckets, those that are low pre-op risk cases, 
and those that are high pre-op risk cases, and we looked at the res respect score, lots of respect by the surgeon. We looked at the disrespect score, a surgeon who modeled lots of disrespect toward other human beings. What did we find? Simple procedures, no measurable difference. But the more complex the surgical procedure is, and when you think about the concept of trust and team performance, those complications go through the roof. And you inherently know this, whether you're in the emergency medicine department, in an NICU, a PICU, or a surgical theater, some professionals walk into a team setting in a stressful circumstance and they bring respect and peace. And other individuals walk into that same environment and what do they bring? They bring the anti-peace. And when you think about the ability of that particular surgeon to cut and tie knots, fine, I'm glad they can, but what's happening to the other team members that are critically supporting the integrity of the sterile field and a host of other things that have to be going on? Now, we are already replicating this study with surgeons from eight institutions, including here as a part of this study, with the complaint database, and we're finding the same thing. This was a pilot, 66 surgeons, 10,000 procedures. We now will have 400 surgeons and 100,000 procedures. So at the end of the day, as leaders, we sort of got to decide, are we really going to get into this human accountability piece? When this particular senior individual just decides I'm not going to wash my hands, I'm just going to go in to give a message, are we going to remain si silent or are we going to speak up? And I'm going to say that it's not an easy decision. There are pros and cons. You just have to choose. But if it's my wife in that bed, and she's got two new knees, I guarantee you where I'm gonna come down in this equation. But it's not sufficient to have personal courage. That is inadequate. And this has been a part of our medical problem as well. We've appointed chiefs of staff and chief medical officers and others, and it's the classic let Mikey do it. Now I want Mikey there. In our institution, we got a great Mikey. But I want to be sure that we've dealt with as many of these issues we've prevented, right? We're pediatricians. We're into prevention. And the way we prevent is to provide feedback when? Early and often and kind because we like that child. Now, I can't talk this way to my surgeons, but that's the truth because I even like them because, again, I want to make this clear, 90% of my surgeons at Vandy are awesome, as are 90% of our pediatricians. It requires a plan, people, process, and technology. So in our environment, these are the essential elements that you have to have because if you don't have all this together, it's sort of tough. Biggest single issue is leadership, and what I mean by this is leadership that will not blink, independent of whether it's a general pediatrician that's misbehaving or the senior biggest ortho RVU producer. That's sort of tough. Next issue, you've got to have an intervention model. Because if you're going to start collecting data about my performance, I want to know how you're going to use it. Isn't that fair? This is about being fair. If we're going to collect data, I want to know exactly how we're going to collect it. I want to know how it's going to be shared. I want to know how I'm going to have an opportunity to do more better. And I'm going to want to know when I get an all clear. That's fair. And then you've got to have a process so that when these reports come in, we get them taken care of. And in our environment, when these disturbances come in, we have them processed within 87% of the time, they're done within two days. Get them in, get it done, move on. What are the surveillance tools? Single most important part of prof promoting professionalism relates to the observations that you make with your own eyes and ears. Now, I got lots of sophisticated data systems. But I want to know from my risk event reporting system, and you saw that my title, one of the things that I got to do is to take risk and marry it with quality and safety so that we are one big happy family. The second thing are the patient relations complaints. I want to know what patients are seeing because when you look at what patients often see and report, they are reporting safety threats. And I want to remind you that for every single unsolicited patient complaint you get, how many do you not hear about? How many walk out the door? 
There's a study by Annandale that looks at the willingness of patients and families to complain about their care. And the ratio for every one we hear at Vanderbilt, we get 5,000. For every one we hear, there are 50 to 70 that walk out the door that we never hear from. So take that 5,000 and multiply it by 50, and then we know they tell 10 friends and neighbors. Multiply by 10. Staff concerns when we're measuring hand hygiene, and now one of the things that I've gotten in is to surgical bundle compliance, and I got dashboards, and I mean when somebody doesn't change gowns at a particular point, there is a data point. Here are some reports from my institution. Dr. Hickson entered the room without foaming in. The nurse standing there offered a pair of gloves as a social response that maybe we ought to be paying attention because he's seeing a patient with a post-op wound infection. Surprise, surprise. And in a very southern way, he took him over to the trash can and dropped him in the trash can and smiled. No throwing, spitting, or cussing. But was that a respectful behavior? Was that respectful for the nurse? Was it respectful for the patient? Was it respectful for our processes? Dr. Hicks had rushed in and said to the team setting up for surgery, let's get going, skip all that extra time out business, get the patient in here. And again, most of the time it's fine. We're not going to operate on the wrong body part. Family reported, witnessed a tense exchange between Dr. Hickson and a nurse. It was difficult to watch someone trying to humiliate another person, and it personally, as a patient, made me feel vulnerable. Again, these are disturbances. I don't know whether they're true or not, but in our environment, we drive this with a pyramid. Note the pyramid. This is our feedback model. Vast majority of professionals, no issues. In fact, one of the ways that we honor you guys sitting in this room is to address those disturbances that do come in. So when an event comes in, single unprofessional event, I have a risk manager and my chief safety officer, a urologist, looks at every one of them every two hours. And they dispatch them in one of two ways. There are certain things that society says that we don't do. We do not lay hands on other human beings. We do not violate sexual boundaries. We do not discriminate against other human beings. When those things come in, there's a very formal process and we're gonna follow it. But for most of the stuff, do you see this word? I don't know whether these reports are true or not. I don't know whether they have merit. But I guarantee for every one of these, if it's a patient complaint, we just push it out electronically. But if it's a staff complaint, I have 120 advanced practice professionals and physicians throughout the health system. They will get that and without, hear this, investigation. We do not investigate any of these stories because I don't want to know. How many times have you been involved in investigating a story about something that happened? And how often do you really find the truth? And that great movie says the truth. You can't handle the truth. It's not worth the effort. So we simply take the approach, I don't know whether it's true or not, as long as it's not one of these. And we just send it out. So in this particular real case, a peer went to that highly influential pediatrician who didn't wash his hands going in the room and said, we got this story. The story does not seem consistent with who, you, who we know you to be. It's not consistent with our goals. I know that there are two sides of this story. I trust you to do the right thing and have a nice day. 90 seconds to three minutes. Get in, deliver the message, and get out. Because one of two things happen, right? It either doesn't happen again, or it happens again. And because I've got a data system, I can be patient. And I don't mind giving a person a second cup of coffee. That's fine. But I had my chairs collectively vote, you chairs, using this ARS technology, you tell me how many get escalated to the next level of intervention. That was really good. I said, however, we all have to make the same agreement. Surgeons, internists, emergency men, we all will have the same standards. They voted 
which then sets the bar to now we need to make you aware that there appears to be a pattern. So a concern is reported, risk management reviews, messenger shares report with a professional and hits a button simply to say, I deliver the message. And here's the data. We have just submitted this paper. We've looked at 10,000 physicians. Remember, the previous slide showed patient complaints. This shows staff complaints. 85 to 90 percent of your professionals, advanced practice professionals, certified nurse midwives have exactly the same distribution curve. 85 to 90 percent of us never get a staff complaint ever. 10 percent get a single complaint. Do I worry about a single complaint? No. Stuff happens as long as it's not an egregious or mandated event. But 3 percent, it's actually 2.6 percent, account for 40 percent of these complaints. So if you get one, fine, I'll give you a cup of coffee. You get a second one, we'll serve a second cup of coffee by peer, but three, we got to send you a letter in the mail, we got to make this a little bit more formal, I need to ask you to reflect why it is that you seem to get more of these than others. This process has been fascinating. Does any of this work? Yeah, it works. This work actually was foundational on a study that was done in Tennessee. Wayne Ray, Fetterspiel, uh, and Bill Schaffner were interested in pediatricians prescribing of chloramphenicol and tetracycline back in the 70s and early 80s. And what they did is that they got data from pharmacy records in the state. They identified those physicians and family practitioners that were using chloramphenicol and tetracycline. They looked at three models for changing physician prescribing. Send them a letter in the mail. You know how effective that was? Next, train a nurse and have the nurse deliver the message. That actually works but is not sustainable. The third message, just get somebody from the community to go deliver the message up here. That process works. Our MedMal work with the PARS system reduces malpractice claims by 70% using exactly the same model. We have used this same model to promote hand hygiene. We have used this same to address behaviors that undermine a culture of safety. This is from our PARS work, of which you guys are a part. We now have overseen more than 1,300 interventions on high malpractice risk physicians in our national model, and we find these results everywhere we go. 78% of those individuals who have a pattern of patient complaints respond to that very wimpy sharing of data. Here you are, your data. It's important to note that 16% require Plan B. And these are individuals that are unable or unwilling to respond. And it's really interesting, we've got a paper in process right now, we've identified 14 physicians in the last two years that have evidence of early cognitive dysfunction that are picked up by the statements and complaints offered by patients and families. And we've actually done a word analysis looking at the content of those complaints and families use very different language in describing those individuals that have impairment in their ability to practice. Six percent take what we call the geographic solution. And we now are in the 20s of physicians who've gone from one site where we do this work to another and they take all their disgruntled patients with them. ROI in terms of we've, Bill's finished the study now looking at the effectiveness of this program in reducing unnecessary med mal expense and it's amazing wherever we are in the country there is an effect because do not ever assume that malpractice is simply a cost of doing business. It is not. I'll leave you with some questions. With respect to Dr. Hickson who enters that room, what's our collective duty to the patient in that room, that family, to the professional himself, and to society in general? And the notion is that it isn't comfortable. But if we're serious about safety and quality, it requires a concerted effort. And that effort must be to fix our dysfunctional systems, but don't think that's sufficient. We got two or three minutes for questions. I'd be honored to take a question or two. Everything is fair game. 
John. Dr. Dixon, thank, thanks for an outstanding presentation and uh, thanks for bringing this work to UCLA. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, MIT surgeon, could there possibly be a surrogate for competence in some way? The surgeon feels uncomfortable with the procedure that uh, is more difficult? John is raising the issue that could this anti-peace surgeon, what really is generating the anti-peace? And John, one of the reasons that we have ramped that study up is because all we're doing, this is a pediatric analogy, this surgeon that models or appears, I want to use that word, models disrespect, this particular child has a fever. How many different causes of fever. And some of that cause may be, in fact, concerns about my technical competence. These are tough cases. It's really interesting, John, because when you look at this in the low surgical pre-op risk, there's just no effect. Now, that may be a sample size issue. It may be related to uh, that when we expand the numbers, we may see the difference. I don't think we will, because I think and reflect back upon my own practice of medicine back before I joined the dark side and became an administrator. But in those days and ages as a general pediatrician, nothing frightened me more than a kid that had a croup that had to be admitted to the hospital. Because when was that kid going to turn south? And the issue is that that heightened my own fear, which changes the way sometimes that I deal with others. So part of that, John, is also this question of regulation. So I think a subset of that group, in fact, will be individuals that will be less technically competent and they sort of inherently know it. The question is, do we have any surveillance system to pick that up and to ask that professional to reflect why it is in that environment? I don't seem to be such a pleasant individual. Now, there are other causes as well. Yes. Oh, please, you. So Kate asked, have we done any similar work with learners? It's really interesting how this has been a slow pilgrimage. I started with patient complaints back in the 90s because it was actually safer to deal with that than other potential sources of observation. And then as I got closer to retirement, I decided I could take on staff complaints. And we did that three years ago because, frankly, uh, that's dangerous because you have this notion that you have these nursing professionals that are super reporters. We have not found that. We've looked for that and have not found that. Learners, gosh, what a problem. And it's a problem because how do you get learners to feel comfortable enough to speak up? Because they see stuff routinely. And then we have this issue that Hickson's going to give me a bad evaluation. And then we have this issue that, gosh, Hickson gave me a bad evaluation, and that's why I'm now reporting. So I've never heard those things, but I think hypothetically they might occur. So we have just rolled this out among our learners. We have had this rolled out now for about four months, and last week we got our first single report. So let me tell you, we're going to go at this, but I am slow and deliberate, and maybe five years from now I'll have eight complaints, and we'll know more. But I really do think that if we are going to introduce our learners to the profession, a duty of a professional is to speak up. But I also, Kate, am not naive. Any last one question? I have uh, something that Please. I'd like you to address. Is there any correlation between staff and patient complaints? And if not, can you speculate why not? So the question is, is there a correlation between patient complaints and staff complaints? My hypothesis of going into this most recent work was that there would be a high correlation between the two, and the answer is, you ready for this? There is not. We find only a 12% overlap between physicians who get lots of patient complaints and physicians who get lots of staff complaints, a 12% overlap. We don't have sufficient numbers at this point, but obviously one of the things that we're doing is that we are also tracking responsiveness to intervention. And the responsiveness of getting a cup of coffee and a staff complaint and doing an awareness, we're seeing the same 80% response rate. We're seeing the 80% response rate with patient complaints. What I'm really interested in is this group of the 12% 
and whether they respond at the same rate for both domains or not. I don't think they will, but that's a hypothesis. I want to thank you for your willingness to listen and engage in some dialogue. I will encourage you to continue. This is not an easy subject. It's one we don't spend enough time talking about, but frankly, I think it is something that's critical to the safety movement. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.